John chapter 18, verse 38. Pilate said to Jesus, what is truth? After Pilate had said this, he went back outside to the Jews and told them, I find no guilt in him, but you have a custom that I should release one man for you at the Passover. So do you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a robber. Then Pilate took Jesus and flogged him, and the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with their hands. Pilate went out again and said to them, See, I am bringing him out to you, that you may know that I find no guilt in him. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe. Pilate said to them, Behold the man. When the chief priests and the officers saw him, they cried out, Crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said to them, Take him yourselves and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, We have a law, and according to that law he ought to die, because he has made himself the Son of God. When Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. He entered his headquarters again and said to Jesus, Where are you from? But Jesus gave him no answer. So Pilate said to him, You will not speak to me. Do you not know that I have authority to release you and authority to crucify you? Jesus answered him, You would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given you from above. Therefore, he who delivered me over to you has the greater sin. Our gracious Father in heaven, we pray that you would open our eyes to see the Lord Jesus more clearly, and we ask it in his name. Amen. This afternoon, we're going to do precisely what Pilate suggests the crowd do in verse 5 of the reading. Chapter 19, verse 5, page 54, if you're here in the building. So Jesus came out wearing the crown of thorns and the purple robe, and Pilate said to them, Behold the man. Now those words, behold the man, are amongst the most famous uttered in Jesus' trial. I'm very much not a culture expert, but even I know that this image of the Lord Jesus standing on the balcony of Pilate's headquarters with the baying crowd below, is amongst the most famous from Jesus' crucifixion. Rembrandt, Albert Brecht, Dürer, Guido Reni, they've all painted it. And I want to ask us this afternoon to imagine ourselves in a portrait gallery. And as we enter in through the door, here are two walls, one on our left, a whole series of paintings stretching out along the gallery. And then one on the other side, right in the middle, with just one portrait. Behold the man. Here is Jesus brought out upon the balcony of Pilate's praetorium and before the baying mob. And what do we see as we look at Jesus standing there. Well, on the one hand, of course, a figure of ridicule. There he had been subject to barrack room brutality as Pilate had handed him over to the soldiers. And we can read about that in verses 1 to 3. Pilate took Jesus and flogged him. And the soldiers twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. They came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews! And struck him with their hands. Behold, the man, as Pilate brings Jesus out onto the balcony. And of course, Pilate at this stage wants to get Jesus and indeed himself off the hook. He's appealing to the Jews over the absurdity of their charge. What, this man? You want this man crucified? What threat is he to anybody? 
But at one and the same time, John, the author of this gospel, wants us to see both Jesus, the man, and also Jesus, the innocent man, and Jesus, the divine man, with all of God's authority. So behold the man, consider his innocence. And innocence is self-evidently the point that we're supposed to pick from Pilate's repeated pronouncements. He goes out to the Jews. He goes back into Jesus. He goes out to the Jews. He goes back into Jesus. He comes out to the Jews again. And each time he makes this pronouncement all the way through verse 38, I find no guilt in him. Verse 4, I'm bringing him out to you that you may know that I find no guilt in him. And then verse 6, Pilate said to them, take him yourself and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. For all the flaws of Pilate, this trial establishes one deliberate point with undeniable clarity. Under the Roman jurisdiction, Jesus had done nothing wrong. He was no threat to the Romans. He was innocent of all charge. Behold the man, I find no guilt in him. Of course, Barabbas is guilty. You can see that in verse 40. He's a robber, most likely a political insurgent. Elsewhere, he's described as a murderer, a militant murderer. Barabbas, he's guilty. The Jews are guilty. Of course, they're guilty as they cry out in verse 40. No, not this man but release Barabbas. They're guilty. And then they cry out again in verse 6, crucify him, crucify him. And then they bay in verse 15, away with him, away with him, crucify him. So Barabbas is guilty, the Jews are guilty. And of course, Pilate, pathetic Pilate, he's guilty as he goes with the mob rather than with truth. But Jesus as he stands here in these mock royal robes with this crown of thorns forced down on his head, I find no guilt in him. He is innocent. And the innocence of Jesus really matters. Remember the key verse that controls all of this narrative is back in chapter 18 and uh, verse 14. And there we are told that Caiaphas had advised the Jews that it would be expedient that one man should die on behalf of the people. So Jesus is going to his death in order to die on behalf of the people. Jesus is going to his death innocent to die for the people. Isaiah, the great prophet of the Old Testament, had spoken of a servant who would go to his death to carry God's judgment at our guilt. And he had said of him, they made his grave with the wicked, with the rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. The possibility of one man carrying God's judgment at the failure of all men is immediately erased if that one man is guilty. But Jesus is innocent. And so behold the man, I find no guilt in him. His closest disciples who lived with him and traveled with him, whom he taught and who they watched. Peter, he committed no sin, no deceit was found in his mouth. Trace back through John's gospel, through all the accounts of Jesus, and you will not be able to find a single charge against this Jesus. I find no guilt in him. Behold the man. He stands before us. He stands before you today, innocent. Behold the man, Jesus But as we behold Jesus standing there on Pilate's praetorium in the balcony of Pilate's headquarters, notice also his extraordinary authority. Uh, And may I say that authority is an 
Well, it's an extraordinary word to use of this man at this time. Because as we look at Jesus now, he has been up all night, shunted from one trial to another. And as we look at Jesus, he is bound, crowned with a mock garland of thorns, beaten to a pulp, clothed in a purple cloak designed to make him the laughing stock of everybody before him. Oh, authority, you might use that word of Pilate, he has all the authority of the Roman Empire. Authority, you might use that word, of the the Jewish high priests, the chief priests and their team. They're in a long line, a succession of authority. And authority, you might use that word, of the soldiers. They've been given license, authority, to do pretty much what they please. But Jesus, behold the man. Pilate has had Jesus flogged, allowed him to be abused by the gathered garrison for their gruesome entertainment. And Pilate now brings Jesus out. Behold the man. This is the man you're so frightened of. Provocative, mockingly ironic. And yet authority is a fitting description. Look at the way Jesus has interacted with Pilate. Do you know, last week we read it, didn't we? As Pilate asks him, are you a king? My kingdom is not of this world. So you are a king then. Ah, for truth, I came into this world and this is the reason why I was born into this world. For truth and anybody on the side of truth listens to me. And now superstitious Pilate drags Jesus back inside. Did you notice, filled with fear, Pilate, where where are you from? You would have no authority over me if it had not been given to you. See, the whole account is designed to bring us face to face with an entirely different kind of power to the kind of power that we see in Pilate or the Jews or the Roman soldiers. And so verse 33, are you a king? Verse 37, 36, my kingdom is not of this world. Verse 37, so you are a king. Verse 39, king of the Jews. Verse three, hail, king of the Jews. Verse 14, behold your king. Verse 15, shall I crucify your king? And doesn't Jesus' refusal to speak, his silence, underscore his quiet authority? You know, he only opens his mouth five times in these series of trials. And in each instance, he turns the tables And on every occasion, he brings accusation and conviction and accountability. Again, Isaiah, he was oppressed and afflicted, yet he did not open his mouth. Like a lamb that is led to the slaughter, like a sheep before its shearers is silence, so he opened not his mouth. Behold the man, innocent, power. This is the man from outside. He comes with all of God's divine power. He's been given up by God as an innocent sacrifice. He stands before us, bloodied, pulp, comic relief, absolute authority. Behold the man. And so we pause for a moment and consider power and authority. This paradoxical image. Uh, Pilate was used to power dressed in military might, the Roman Empire. The Jewish authorities were used to power clothed in political compromise and deals. The soldiers were used to power enforced by terror. Yet is not Jesus strangely disturbing as he stands before us, this Jesus, whose eyes follow us and follow the scene. Pilate thinks he is. 
And so you come to verse 7 of chapter 19. When the chief priests and officers saw Jesus, they cried out, crucify him, crucify him. Pilate said, take him yourself and crucify him, for I find no guilt in him. The Jews answered him, we have a law, and according to that law, he ought to die because he made himself the son of God. And when Pilate heard this statement, he was even more afraid. This innocent man with such authority who speaks truth to power, Pilate suddenly grasped that he is being confronted by something more than merely human. Behold the man. Weakness, humility, innocence, integrity, power, authority. But we cannot come away from this trial scene without for a moment examining the other individuals in the account. I asked us to imagine going into a gallery on one side of the walls as we looked down the corridor, a whole series of images, and on the other side, behold the man. And you know how it is with a fine portrait. They always say the eyes follow you round the room, and as the man looks out on the characters in the trial scene. Each one comes under his gaze. Behold the man, the murderous resistance of the Jews. They are guilty. We'll return to this next week. The Jews are adamant that they will not be ruled by Jesus. Jesus was fearless in his exposure of their religious hypocrisy, and Jesus demanded change, repentance, a genuine turning back to God, a personal acceptance of the rule of King Jesus. And the Jews are adamant that Jesus be crucified. And so verses 39 and 40, you want me to release to you the king of the Jews? They cried out again, no, not this man, but Barabbas. Now Barabbas was a murderer. They were guilty. And you can see in verse 6, when they bay for Jesus' blood, Jesus has simply insisted that as divine Lord and judge, as ruler over the people of God, people turn back to him, their creator God, as Jesus insists today. But they will have none of it. And so they brush aside his rightful rule, crucify him, why they're guilty. And then there's the base brutality of the soldiers. They are guilty in verses 1 through 3. He took Jesus and flogged him, and they twisted together a crown of thorns and put it on his head and arrayed him in a purple robe. And they came up to him saying, Hail, King of the Jews, and struck him with his hands. What we find here is the stuff of any unregulated barrack room in the world. Soldiers far from home, short of amusement, immunized from considering the suffering of others without the civilizing effects of their families, they are capable of absolutely anything. Think of Abu Ghraib. Think of the things that took place in Northern Ireland in the 1970s. Indeed, think of the rugby club at the end of a long night out or the battalion boxing night or those football stands in a particularly close derby match. Uh, the flogging could have been one of three sorts. Mark tells us Jesus was flogged again after he was handed over to be crucified. Almost certainly that was the ver verberatio, which left a person virtually stripped of flesh, bones bare, and on occasion entrails hanging out. But this prior flogging was probably less severe a fustigatio beating designed to teach a lesson. And then the soldiers dress Jesus in a purple robe, crown him with a garland woven together of pine thorns, many as long as 12 inches long. And then they come forward. And in the other gospels we read, they give him a staff to symbolize rule. And as they come forward, they grab the staff and bring it crashing down on his head. And here in John's account, they slap him across the face with their leather-clad hands. Here we have the guilt of every man 
woman, child, in treating Jesus with utter contempt. Jesus a swear word. Oh Christ, Jesus Christ. Utter contempt, parody. And then there's the failure of Pilate. Boy, he's guilty. We can trace Pilate through the trial, moving from a position of authority and investigation to a position of impotence and ultimately fear. And in one sense, it's not hard to sympathize with Pilate. He has on his hands the possibility of a, a mass civic uprising. It is Passover. Up to a million Jews descended on Jerusalem at Passover time. Jerusalem was always volatile, but at Passover it was a tinderbox. And now he has the religious leaders on Passover morning with a royal pretender. And yet when they tell Pilate that Jesus claims to be the son of God, superstitious Pilate grasps that he's dealing with something out of this world, something that might be utterly terrifying. And so he is filled with fear. And in one sense, it's not hard to sympathize him with him, but on the other hand, we, we surely are filled with utter contempt for Pilate. He's been told that Jesus has come into the world for truth. What is truth? He's not interested in truth, but he's the ruler. He grasps that he's dealing with something out of this world, and he doesn't do what is right. And Pilate knows Jesus is innocent, senses he's dealing with something serious has heard the claims of Jesus and he walks away and goes the way of the mob. He washes his hands of the whole thing. In one sense, Pilate is a classic 21st century city of London figure, full of bluster and bravado, full of boardroom bonhomie. But it, when it comes to the decision that matters most to side with Jesus, to come to Jesus, to follow the truth, to stand against the crowd. Pilate is hand-wringingly wet. He just goes the way of the mob. I have to say I've dealt with so many Pilates in the city over the last 25 years. Here is J.C. Ryle. <clears throat> we see Pilate knowing what was right and yet afraid to act on that knowledge. Convinced in his own conscience that he ought to acquit the prisoner, yet afraid to do so lest he should displease his accusers. Sacrificing the claims of justice to the base fear of man. Sanctioning from sheer cowardice an enormous crowd. And finally, countenancing from love of man's good opinion the murder of an innocent prisoner. Never perhaps did human nature make such contemptible exhibition. So we have the guilt of the Jews, we have the guilt of the soldiers, we have the guilt of Pilate, and of course the guilt of Jude, Judas. What we have on display then in this trial scene is the very worst of humanity, isn't it? Failed power and authority, self-interested religious power, brutal, barbaric power and betrayal. And those eyes behold the man of this Jesus as he stands on the balcony, follows, sees, exposes, judges it all. And surely as he stands there, we cannot, as we stand at the door of the gallery... We cannot but sense those eyes falling on us. Kind of on which side do we find ourselves? Will we stand with the world? The rejection of God by the Jews, the mockery and derision of God by common man, O oh Christ, O oh Jesus. The weak, intellectual, morally flawed, pathetic failure of Pilate, I'll just go with everybody else and do what leads to a quiet life. The betrayal of God, of Jesus, Judas. Or will we come to Jesus? Those eyes, not only of innocence, of authority, of love. Now here's the thing, verse 11. 
as Jesus responds to Pilate, you would have no authority over me at all unless it had been given to you from above. And so it is God's purpose that Jesus go to his death innocent, royal, powerful, humble authority to carry human sin and to rescue people from this desperate wickedness of this world in his love to his kingdom, which is not of this world. Which side do you stand on? Will you come out from the wickedness of the world? Will you finish your prevarication, your weakness in not doing the right thing? Will you come across from the brutality of the soldiers? Will you come to the Lord Jesus who goes to his death on that cross out of love for you so that you can be forgiven and be part of his eternal kingdom? Well, I pray that you will. Let's pray. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. We see Jesus, behold the man. We praise you for his innocence, behold the man. We thank you, our Father, for the authority of Jesus, this quiet truth full of integrity and righteousness. And we praise you for his love. And we ask our Father that many amongst us might come from out of the wickednesses of this world to the Lord Jesus to be part of his glorious kingdom. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.